And to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. You are watching Mark Dolan and it's time now for Headliners. You know the drill, two top comedians looking at tomorrow newspaper front pages. And uh, lots to get through, some brilliant stories. But first up, the headlines with Karen. Thank you, Mark. I'm Karen Roberts in the GB newsroom. The Prime Minister will speak on the phone to President Putin and will visit Ukraine in the coming days. Boris Johnson says he's determined to accelerate diplomatic efforts to avoid conflict with Russia. But he's also considering fresh military deployments and bolstering NATO defences in the region. It's after Moscow told the West its main security concerns over Ukraine have not been addressed. But speaking earlier, US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin says there is no reason the situation has to escalate. Conflict is not inevitable. There is still time and space for diplomacy. The United States, in lockstep with our allies and partners, has offered Russia a path away from crisis and toward greater security. Meanwhile, British companies are being warned to strengthen their digital defenses following malicious online attacks in Ukraine. The National Cyber Security Center says the incidents bear the hallmarks of Russian activity. No current threats have been identified in the UK, but guidance has been updated to ensure businesses stay vigilant. The Met Police says it's received the material it requested from the Cabinet Office as part of the investigation into alleged Downing Street lockdown breaches. Scotland Yard are under fire after asking that minimal reference be made to events at Number 10 in Sue Gray's official report. The force says it's to avoid prejudice to their inquiries, but confirm the investigation hasn't been escalated to a criminal one. Critics say a swift publication of Miss Gray's report in full is in the public interest. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says it's becoming too much of a distraction. We've got a criminal investigation into the behaviour of the Prime Minister and what went on in Downing Street. There are bound to be process issues along the way. But this is caused by one thing, and that's the behaviour of the Prime Minister. The Home Secretary has approved the extradition of a British technology tycoon to the US. Dr Mike Lynch is facing charges of criminal fraud. It's after he lost a multi-billion dollar action over the sale of his software company, Autonomy, to Hewlett Packard in 2011. Dr Lynch is accused of deliberately overstating the value of his business. And the government is pledging to officially recognise British Sign Language. It's after a new bill had an unopposed second reading in the Commons. Campaigners hope the legislation will improve access for deaf people and promote signing during public announcements. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Headliners. Thanks, Karen, for that reliable news bulletin. It's about to get very unreliable because you're watching Headliners, where we take a comedic romp through Saturday's headlines. Joining me on this occasion are two fantastic comedians, Hayden Prowse and Andrew Doyle. So, chaps, how are we tonight? Very well. Yeah, Hayden, what's happening? Are you in a good mood? Is your glass half full? Glass half full, yeah. Glass half oh, full, yeah. That's all right. That's unusual for a comedian, isn't it? It is. It's, yeah, it's true. I am. I think I'm generally half empty, cynical, manic, depressive. But I wore, I wore a dinner jacket to keep up with Andrew, who no, always... You see, this is what upsets <laughs> yeah. me, because I dress down deliberately and I expect you to do the same. And you this is dressing down? This was like 30 quid from a oh, second right. shop, but that look, you look... This is my Black Friday Hugo Boss purchase. Yeah, I don't like, like it. We all know that because he's still got the label hanging yeah, yeah. on the side. <laughs> have you got to that, ever had that thing where you get a bargain and you have to tell people how much you paid? No. People say, nice shoes. You're like, 
12 quid yeah. to, to pay back. <laughs> in the, uh, but you don't wear shoes, do you? you not really, no. I, uh, I like to go barefoot as yeah. much as I can. I'm not wearing any pants. I love that, but it's so huckleberry thin. I really like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it was poverty originally, but uh, no, look, I think that uh, being barefoot's quite nice, you know, in touch with nature. Yeah. And the odd dog poo. <laughs> Mm. Not ideal. Don't try that one at home. Well, look, lots to get through. Let's have a look at Saturday's front pages. As you might expect, they're dominated by the Met Police's investigation into the Downing Street parties and the effect their intervention has had on Sue Gray's report. The Daily Mail says there's outrage at the police and in particular the Met Commissioner Cressida Dick. They report that Whitehall sources claim it could leave the government and the country in limbo. The only positive aspect of that story is it does mean that the expression dick out was trending for most of the day. The Times also says that anger is being directed towards the Met Police, claiming that Sue Gray is frustrated and angered by the developments. And The Independent focuses on criticism of the Met Police as well, with <coughs> Liberal Democrat leader Ed Davey. I can't believe it. Is he still going? saying it raised the spectre of an establishment stitch-up. The Guardian says a heavily redacted version of the Grey Report will be released imminently. The FT reports there is Tory anger over what it describes as a farce. The Daily Mirror is one of the few papers that doesn't lead with Sue Grey. They say that BP and Shell are making £900 a second thanks to increased gas prices. The Telegraph also focuses on the energy crisis saying household bills are set to rise by nearly half to £1,900 by April. And those are your headlines. So that's your big story of the day, Sue Gray's report and the Met's intervention. Hayden, what a mess. What a mess. I don't understand this story because every time I go past number 10, there are at least three or four policemen on the door of number 10. So if they want to investigate the party, shouldn't they just check their records or after, ask the officers that were on the door that day? Correct. They were yeah, literally they were the bouncers they're... for the illegal party on the day of the exactly raid. Exactly right. Yeah. And they're probably in number 10 as well, I would have thought. They must have some yeah. security right. operatives. Right. They were, they were doing the list. They were the list girls on the door, weren't they? Yeah. Let Do you think maybe out. some of the cops you know, within the sort of Downing Street complex were offered a glass of Pinot Grigio and, yeah, you know, they lost sure. their professional perspective? Yeah. What's that clinking in that roller case you've got there, madam? Isn't that's that's bribery. flows. That's bribery. Bribery of a cop with Pinot Grigio. Yeah. Well, you know, it's certainly we certainly get uh, you know get my compliance. But yeah, I mean, this, I don't, is, I don't. this is an absolute disaster for not yeah. just for, for uh, the government and for Boris Johnson, oh. but for all of us because we've still got to read about Partygate. Yeah, it's constant. But I think he's sort of banking on the fact that in a couple of months people will be bored of it. Do you think they will? I don't think this outrage is going to die. It seems to be sort of universal. But I think do you the, not think this the, is a Westminster bubble story? Don't you think no. this is a story that the media are obsessed with? I think it. I, well, my feeling is that the media are too obsessed with it, and they're going to concentrate too much of their outrage into too small a space of time, whereas if they spread it a bit thinner, we'd still be outraged in a month's time when the, you know, and, and we'd... Yeah, uh, so they're, they're, they're sort of they're blowing they're it overplaying their hand a, a little, little bit. A little bit, I think, yeah. But yeah. It's, not a, it's not a Westminster story. I think the whole world is completely, completely outraged by this. Really? Just... Andrew? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the key thing about this story is the fact that the Scotland Yard are now saying that it has to be redacted. The report has mm. to be redacted. So Sue Gray's... And it's actually saying explicitly the report can be published in a redacted form that makes minimal reference to <coughs> lockdown breaches, mm. which, which feels odd to us. I mean, it would be like getting a, an autopsy done and asking them just to take out the references to the dead guy. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's a bit like that. However, on the other hand, I, I'm kind of torn on this, right? Because, of course, that's the point of Sue Gray's report, is mm. to sort of, uh, you know, identify the potential criminality mm. of this behaviour. On the other hand, there is an ongoing criminal investigation, right? Yes. In which case, if you do have this report come out, which, which reveals all the gory details, that might compromise the investigation and compromise the prosecution. There's so no I do jury. get that. There's no jury, which is normally the reason not to mention yes. the... Yeah, but not relevant. Yes, and also what, what, uh, what they're considering publishing is not considered to be a criminal... But it has come so. from... Hey, look, I defer to the judgment of Scotland Yard on it, insofar as it has come from Scotland Yard. They're saying this for a reason. Mm -hmm. I, but I do understand why people mm -hmm. uh, like is it Ed Davey has suggested. It, yeah. it, it creates the kind of suggestion of a cover-up, all this kind of thing. It certainly doesn't do the Tories... I, I'm sure, in fact, the Tories are not happy 
about this redaction because it, because no. if anything it makes them look worse it makes them look like they do have something to hide mm. or maybe they do have something to hide I don't know I don't know I think just the, the damage to public trust is just immense oh it's huge I don't yeah. think you get over this and ultimately people aren't going to forgive it and it, you know even a lot of people of course broke the rules a lot yeah. of people sort of turned a blind eye to various rules right but the, but the issue is uh, a lot of people didn't a lot of people went along with it even in the most horrendous circumstances mm. and then they see the people who set the rules mm. break the rules and not only that the people who set the rules claim they didn't understand the rules. Yeah. Well, then, if you set the rules and you don't understand the rules, really, you're not in a great position. Then. I mean, I broke a lot of the rules, but a bit later. This is quite early to be breaking the rules. This oh, was, is that this right? Was, this was super round. early, and also yeah, they super... were straight out the traps. Right, no one knew what was going on, and he was drunk half the time, which yeah. baffles me as well. If you were, you know, if if you had that weight, what? Boris was drunk of responsibility half the time. on your that's shoulders. A, that's a hell of an allegation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's the pain? A few things. foolish, uh, poor judgment. Yeah. I'm not sure we Sorry. can prove that. But yeah. but then again, you know, he's been linked to these parties. Uh, this one will run and run, like, of course, so many of those alleged parties at Downing Street. Alleged. Uh, well, indeed. Well, let's uh, crack on. Saturday's Mirror is leading with a story that's a source of huge stress for many across the country. Troubling times ahead, Andrew. Yes, we've been reporting on this for a few weeks, the, the rise in uh, various energy prices, which are going to hit lots and lots of families. The Mirror here is going with this story about how the, sh the gas giants, Shell and BP, are making apparently £900 a second in profits, uh, thanks to increased gas prices. Uh, they've, they've raked in more than £7 billion between them in just a, a period of three months. Mm -hmm. So they're making a hell of a lot of money. And they give, the, the mirror here gives the example specifically of Shell's boss, uh, Ben Van Burden, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who, who's, ha who's earned over 70, or no, up to £70 million since he took charge in 2014. Now, this is going to hit people very hard, just in, just in terms of the sense of injustice of it all, insofar as with the rising cost, I mean, the, the mirror is very specific about the statistics. So around two, 22 million households will have their energy bills soaring more than £600, about 50%, to over £1,900 a year when this all kicks in early April. Now, the problem with that is, you know, that's fine if you're a wealthy individual, and I know a lot of the people in Parliament come from wealthy backgrounds, uh, perhaps they don't really understand the, the significance of that. But if you are someone who is struggling to sustain yourself, to stay above water, that is, that's sort of the difference between whether or not you can feed your kids properly, right? It's actually mm. really immense. And I think this whole thing, with all the Tories' talk of levelling up and the importance of, of um, fealty to the, uh, the Red Wall areas, the industrial heartlands who lent them their vote, according to Boris Johnson, these poorer areas, this stuff really matters, and it suggests a, a government that's completely out of touch with, with, with regular people. I think it's really, it's really bad. Yes, and, and this is just going to continue to be a problem for the government because the inflationary picture is not a good one, Peyton. Yeah, We've got, obviously Especially this, if benefits this, don't rise accordingly. It's gonna yeah, be, it's gonna be an ongoing power bit. struggle between Vladimir Putin and the West. Yeah, yeah. Well, America's sending some gas, aren't they? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. but, I, but that's, I've that's done some stuff on uh, on Shell for BBC recently, and yeah, I mean it's outrageous. I think their their marketing budget is about four billion a year. Yeah, so they could be giving some of that back, and most of that's sort of like green posturing. It's all nonsense. Their Twitter feed is basically equivalent to Greta Thunberg's. <laughs> right. They're more, more forthcoming about their core business interests than Ghislaine Maxwell. They're yeah. just you know they're just constantly <laughs> virtue signalling about how green they are, and they spend billions on it. And um, yeah, people are really really well, struggling. I mean, it's no. No, right now. no great revelation that, that big oil companies earn a lot of money. Yeah, we, we know that, but it's, it's, it's the extent of the uh, yeah, disparity that I think just is like sticking a knife into a lot mm. of people. Yeah, and my worry is that now, and of course, you know, that the cost of living crisis is just that, and we've got to do something. But I'm worried that really the default now has been for two years that the government's got to like stump up. But there is just a limited pot of money. In fact, there's no money, just is there? two trillion quid's worth uh, of debt. Oh, yeah. And now people are saying, well, the government have got to sort of chip in and help people with their household bills. Now, I get that, but how are we going to pay for that? I don't, you're, you're talking sort of George Osborne economics from <laughs> 10 years ago. The magic money tree exists. We've all realised that now. Rishi pulled it out of the bag. You can that right? create as much money as you want. As long as you direct this, it in the right areas. How big is this tree, I wonder? It's huge. How, it's, it's, it's a big huge. old tree. It's endless. OK. As long as you give it to people that are going to spend it, not the uber-rich that are going to stick it in their bank accounts, it works. Isn't there a, isn't there a price cap solution to this? Yeah. Or am I just being really naive? I could be. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> right. That comes up for Pretty renewal, uh, and that's going to be looked at again, and it's expected to be a lot higher, and that's a huge problem for households. So uh, something that needs to be watched, but the cost of living crisis is something that's a big focus here at <clears> GB <throat> News, and we'll be reporting on it, um, of course, every step of the way but it looks like it's going to get worse before it gets better. Lots more to come from my brilliant panellists tonight. In a couple of minutes, we've got stories about 
the 1%, a 25% increase in productivity, and security drones. See you shortly. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. Welcome back to Headliners on GB News, TV and radio. Uh, we've got tomorrow's front pages and reacting to them, two top comedians, the creme de la creme of the UK comedy circuit, Andrew Doyle and Hayden Prowse. Now, in The Independent, the US are worried, worried that uh, oligarchs in London might compromise any future sanctions on Russia. Andrew? Yeah, this is interesting. Is it? So we all know that the, the presence of... Russian oligarchs in London and the amount of uh, real estate that they have. I mean, this is well known. There's no big revelation here. Uh, this article is talking about how uh, the government has estimated that there's uh, the amount of corrupt money coming in from Russia estimates at 100, 100 billion pounds a year. Uh, now, there's a, uh, and they're, they're, they're suggesting here that basically this is a kind of, I mean, it's described here as a laundromat for dirty money. Uh, and in, in other words, like, so uh, foreign powers can stash their money in, in property. Um, and there's all sorts of implications for this at the moment, given the political situation in Russia. You know, if, any, if, any, if anyone wants to impose sanctions on Russia because of any potential incursions into Ukraine, uh, it's going to be difficult if, if London is effectively at the behest of major Russian power brokers, yes. a lot of whom have mm. ties to Putin. Um, and there's all sorts of issues going on here because, for instance, uh, this article claims that the Tories are reported to have received £2 million from donors with Russian links since Boris Johnson became Prime Minister in 2019. Uh, now, I don't know... Uh, about the extent of that it sounds a little bit, I mean, I'm sure this, it's true, but I, I don't think it could necessarily make much of a difference. But it's something, it could be weaponized, certainly, in terms yeah. of the political games. Uh, but I would caveat all of this because um, there is a tendency, I think, of late to kind of scapegoat Russia and to, to, to turn it into this kind of uh, phantom monster that it mm. perhaps not really, it really isn't. I mean, like, you know, yeah. Don, we had the conspiracy theories about how they effectively appointed Donald Trump in the 2016 election. They swung the election. Well, that was all, it was, it was nonsense. Similarly, we've, I mean, do you remember when Bed Brand, Bed Branchow stood, Ben Bradshaw stood up in Parliament and said that Brexit was swung by oh, the yes. Russians, right? Yeah. I mean, what we do know is that they have some troll farm accounts where they create social media mm. posts, right? But that doesn't swing people's votes. People think about it and they vote according to their conscience. So, um, you know, so there's a bit of a uh, boogeyman. Is it boogeyman or bogeyman? Bogeyman. 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 Yeah. Boogeyman's a dancer, isn't it? Yeah, I think a boogeyman is probably Jules Holland. Boogeyman. Yeah, that would be more accurate. Nice. But, I, but I'm just saying there's Possibly a caveat there. Possibly Winifred Atwell. 
back in her day. Who's Winifred Atwell? A wonderful sort of boogie woogie piano player. Oh, well, I should she know. She was a boogie lady. If I'm going to use the terms, I should know the, the history. <laughs> but what I would say, yeah, so I, I would just... seem quite... He's not going to invade, is he? I mean, it, it's the whole thing is quite performative, isn't it? It's like... I... Leave it, Vlad! I don't think it's so. not worth it. Is he Joe? like that guy down the pub? Yeah, sort of like I'll always be back. threatening to punch yeah, he's not, someone. It's not, not going to happen. He's got an economy the size of Italy. If he goes and invades Ukraine, vast country, guerrilla war for the next ten years, he's going to have no money. And everyone sort of yeah, it makes him an evil genius when in fact he's a sort of yeah, third exactly. Villain. I mean, I'm, I'm very skeptical about the potential for invasion just because you know they talk about these. 100,000 troops massing on the border. They did yeah. that last April, didn't they? And, and nothing yeah. really happened. But anyway, so I, I would they just say... They look quite scary, those troops. I mean, they are yeah. scary, beefy men. Yeah. They're hench. And they'd kill all of us. I could take a few. Yeah. Me? But, yeah. you know, yeah, there yeah, is that. We'd just stand behind you. But I would say... Uh, yeah, that would be the way to do it. But I would suggest that, uh, you know, the idea that we could potentially put sanctions on Russia anyway, mm. given that they have so much invested in our economy, I mean, that's true. That's nonsense. Well, also, isn't that's it the real politic? Don't you think, Hayden, that, you know, we do business with Saudi Arabia and many yeah. other countries with a really bad human rights record, China, of course, as well. Yeah. And so therefore, it's a bit hypocritical to moan about the Russians. And we welcome their billions into London. Mm. They buy their Bentleys Off and they stay bridge. at the Dorchester Hotel. They splash the cash mm. and we, we benefit. We do benefit. Yeah, half of the London art scene would collapse if, uh, if we decided yeah. to sanction and, Russia. And half the Ukraine. Premier League. Exactly, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, all money's dirty. If you trace it back far enough, That's I guess. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So maybe, you know, leave old Vladdy alone. It's not yeah. worth Vladdy, it. Vladdy, my God. It's not worth it. Not only is he he's, not he's, going he's on to... first name. To, he wants a job on RT. Yeah, he? he's not going to invade Ukraine. And he's got a nickname. He's getting a proper <laughs> PR makeover tonight. Brilliant stuff. From The Times, a list of this year's highest taxpayers has been released. Mm. Now, Hayden, you're on quite a few lists, but not this one. <laughs> <laughs> Which list are you referring to? Well... Uh, first, I'd, of all, uh, first of all, you're on. I had Vladimir everyone Putin's, dealt with the new you're on Vladimir Putin's Christmas card list. Oh, fantastic! Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't it? <laughs> Um, yeah, this is this is uh, interesting. Massive um, hike in tax revenue from the 50 biggest uh, tax contributors in the country. 510 million rise. Denise Coates, who owns Bet365, is the biggest. 480 million. She uh, she she gave. That was her tax bill in that was one her year. Tax bill more 480 more than 480 million. million. This is, is, and, and she needs to have a word Wait. with Gary Barlow's tax accountant, doesn't she? This is mad. Around one pound in every five pound of tax identified by the researchers in this in the study stems from people who earn most of their money through gambling. Almost all of our rich people in this no. country have their fortunes based on, on. A, I mean, you know, other countries, I guess, make cars or weapons or dig for oil, and we're just really good at throwing our money away. Oh, well, especially now with social media. I mean, it's those gambling sites, and I've seen people get really addicted. I mean, and I, I can say I got addicted to a game on my phone and I was spending money on that, so I had to delete it. That was a, really? a robot unicorn thing. And I deleted it and now it was fine. But so I mean, got a robot unicorn. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah, it's called... No, I'm not going to advertise it because, honestly, it, it, it will suck you in and destroy your life. I was going to say it's a tax on stupidity, but you're no, very no, no, no. smart. I have an incredibly addictive personality and so right. I sympathise with people who do. And I can see that gambling in particular, you know, unlike the other forms of addiction which ravage your body, this ravages your mind. I mean, you, and, you, you know, and, and you end up borrowing money from people that you can't pay back, yeah. losing friends, yeah. families breaking up. I think it is a big... Awful. It is awful. And it isn't surprising to me that someone's getting rich on other people's misery. Mm. Uh, and, you know, people... But at least she's paying tax, though. She's paying a lot of tax. Good for the economy. It's, it's bad for gambling. I mean, the funny thing is, the psychology of it is such that, although this woman clearly makes a lot of money, that's... That's a tough old check to write, isn't it? 480 mil. You, 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 her hand her, yeah. is trembling as you it's write it. But to her, it's nothing. You know, it's like, I mean, it's not nothing. It's but half a billion, isn't it? Yeah, but she's got another half billion in what the bank, she, probably that, more that she that. keeps. And what yeah. is she I'd still be crying. Yeah. No, I think I would gladly give that. If I had that much money, I think that would be your responsibility, wouldn't it? That's really? I, at that point, I'd be thinking, is that swimming pool tax deductible? But no one needs this much money, you know. Like so, this you know, the, the wealthiest ten percent of the country hold well, half, the, half the wealth. Well, maybe she's probably got a big mansion what? to heat. I mean, look, it's true. I love that you're, you're, you're playing, playing the violin. Look, we, we, we're here to, tonight. We're here to defend billionaires, yeah. Vladimir Putin, <laughs> Boris Johnson. Look, I don't begrudge people their wealth. I just sort of think there comes a point, doesn't there, where it's so egregious. Mm. Where you, you're like, how can you, uh, you don't, no one needs that much money, do they? I mean, this is the old lefty coming out of me now, but I just don't see it as... Not that old. No, no looking good as well. Very I useful. You, <laughs> you have to ask what those people would have done with that money had they not gambled it away. What, would the people, been, you mean gambled? Yeah, would it have been better spent? 
No, the people who get the no, no, no. I think Amazon is no. a very good investment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's much better it's than going back ice, to Tesla, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Just going no, to, look, to Paddy Power. If you can gamble responsibly, it is a lot of fun. I will grant you that, right? But it's the pe but it's people who are, they're not mm. enjoying just throwing away everything. They, they seem they to have. be loving it. Yeah. They're ridiculous. <laughs> a wider point, <laughs> though. Is it time for us to stop demonising rich people, given the fact that they do pay an enormous amount of tax? I mean, James Dyson's a good example. Boris Johnson was, was trolled effectively by Keir Starmer at the dispatch mm -hmm. box because of his friendship with James mm -hmm. Dyson, as though being friendly with a billionaire is somehow a shameful thing. Dyson, his personal tax bill every year is well over 100 million. But I mean, I, this guy I, I is feel, a force for good in this country. If you've created something genuinely beneficial for society, we used to have a great empire, now we have a half decent hand dryer. That's all we, <laughs> yes. that's all we produce the as a air nation. <laughs> and, and betting, yeah, air blades. Damn good hand, hand dryer. It's, it's all right. And <laughs> if you've actually... I find it more fun than the robot <laughs> unicorn game, actually. Well, you haven't that? tried the robot unicorn game, so that, this well, snide... I've had hours <laughs> of fun with the, uh, with the Dyson blade, let me tell you. OK. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Are you on a list for that? Man, well? Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, it hits the spot. Oh, really? But I mean, aren't, aren't these people, don't they deserve our thanks rather than our, our criticism? Mark, I wasn't trying to, de I don't want to demonise anyone, rich or mm. poor. I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying these are evil people because they've got all the money. What I'm saying yeah, But is don't that, you think some people think that? Because I know you don't think that, but don't you think that's the some, narrative from the left in this well, country? Some, I, I think it's very difficult to say that the left has a view. I think some mm. people on the left have that view. And sometimes it's very easy to demonise uh, people who you don't know or people who are your political opponents. And, mm. you know, they're just human beings like the rest of us. Um, my point was simply that, you know, uh, I, if you are that rich, you're a lot of rich people are perfectly happy to pay more than their fair share. Mm -hmm. I think proportionate taxation just makes sense for a sound economy. It makes sense for yourself as well. I mean, if you're that rich and you're putting that much back uh, to the country, it benefits you because it reduces crime rates and it, it helps, you know. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why, you know, it's a good system. At least she's not going offshore like Sir Jim Ratcliffe. Oh, yes, that's yeah. right. No, not What's long that? after his... Uh, his uh, his, his, he got knighted, didn't he? And then he, he went, yeah. see you later. Finally, a rich, privileged person you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> Good news. <laughs> Hayden, we've finally achieved balance. Uh, well, look, it's an interesting one. And uh, clearly, uh, those people who generate a lot of income for the country have to pay their way via taxation as well. According to Saturday's Daily Mail, Brits played with themselves. Can I say... Well, it's onanism. That's the Latin word. Onanism. Isn't it? Uh, yes. Better. Yeah, they, they achieved self-pleasure. Yeah. 25% uh, more over lockdown. Andrew, does that, oh, Onan, does that Onanism number is... sound familiar to you? <laughs> Onanism is a reference to Onan from the Bible, who, of course, was smited by God for um, spilling his seed upon the floor when he should have impregnated his brother's wife. Anyway, let's not get into the biblical theology at the moment. It's the story of my life, that it, one. It, well, look, it's very common. Um, but what I would say... So, yeah, so people were uh, masturbating more often during lockdown. I don't know how they got this figure... So 25% more. I have no idea how you even begin to assess this or why you would want to. Uh, but I, I how think many of them it, were on Zoom at the time? Yeah, that's... Well, that's they don't, wonder. They don't specify... Uh, I, I, I'm very... Well, look, this isn't rocket science. I mean, it's people are bored. Mm -hmm. It was quite interesting because experts have thought there might be a baby boom because obviously couples are all at home together for far more often. It turns out they're just um, spending time with themselves uh, more often during, during lock time. But, you know, what do you expect? I mean, a lot of people... They were going to read lots of long books or even write a book during lockdown. And actually, when it comes to it, you procrastinate. Yeah. As long as they were following government advice at the time of singing happy birthday while they were doing it. Twice. Well, that was twice. Was that the way you were meant to do it? I yeah. can never quite get through yeah, the second chorus. Do you know, it wouldn't surprise me if the government started giving uh, yeah. suggestions and details. Because didn't they start yeah. saying, you should, maybe you should yeah. wear a jumper yeah. and keep the windows open. Maybe you should. Like, they do get quite involved, mm. don't they? They do, they do. And an energy company got in trouble for suggesting that people do star jumps or cuddle their pets in order well, to keep, uh, keep warm at home. Well, there's good reasons for oh, yeah. um, in Increased um, onanism is actually good for the onanism health. Onanism well. would actually warm you up as well. Does it warm you up? Warms you up. Vigorous. Oh, what's the, Let's not what's, get too specific okay. about the uh, Absolutely. technique. Absolutely, I keep getting um, in trouble for. But uh, but apparently, well, I would say don't try this at home. But I think maybe you should try this. At home. <laughs> no, I, I was going to say it, it, it decreases your risk of prostate cancer if, if, if right. men if men uh, masturbate more. Now, can can, can I, I say that. that you're both self-employed entertainers? So that sort of level of self pleasure is kind of already priced in. I would have thought. Mm. Like you won't have seen a twenty five percent bump because I mean that pretty much describes. You know, your pre-pandemic level, I would have thought. Yeah. I mean, let's not Tax get personal uh, yeah. about this. I'm a Catholic and I find the whole activity <laughs> vile and deplorable. And you'll be hell-bound for it. But it's good for your health. So mm. you've got to, you know, 
that's your story and Swings you're sticking to it. Well, on that uh, rather uh, physical note, let's move on. Saturday's Express is reporting a new legal avenue for the return of Shamima Begum to the country. Hayden, does she yeah. get a thumbs up from you? I know you're a fan of well, she Russian oligarchs. What does. about uh, <laughs> what about those accused of terrorists? Old. I mean, we've all done crazy things at 15, whether it was smoking pot behind the bike shed or a bit of jihad. I think she should be forgiven. She's also said she wants to be an asset if, if she's brought back, which sounds smart. It's the mm. sort of thing Smiley would do, right? You know, bring her back mm. in, release her. Maybe this yes. is all part of the game plan. This All this sort of theatrics is a, is a way of uh, maybe we'll keep her there. Where is she in Syria? She well, where specifically? She's in, she? she's in a camp in Syria right now, isn't she? Um, I don't know her exact where about, yeah. but, I, you know, she's trying to... Uh, the, I mean, this article suggesting that she is using the modern slavery precedent. Right. Mm. So to suggest that because she was a victim of slavery, that should mean that she should be able to return to the UK, or at least That's it strengthens her case. That. Well, no, I wasn't trying to do your job for you, Hayden. <laughs> I was just sort of saying that... But the problem with this is, you know, this isn't quite how slavery typically works. Most slaves don't get a train ticket, then a boat fare, and and go, go to the, uh, the source of the slavery in order to embrace it. So it's not, it, she did make a choice. The, the, she was groomed, though. Well, the, 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 this is the point, isn't it? Like, so, you know, I do believe in redemption. I believe that people can change it. And, uh, you know, and she was 15 years old. But it's quite interesting, isn't it, that we've had Lord Adonis in the House of Lords today saying we need to lower the voting age to 16, that people, young people can take responsibility for themselves in the mm. most important choices that they could mm. potentially make. Uh, but for some reason, Shamima Begum was just a, a mindless... It's almost like when you hit 16, all of a sudden, then you've got agency. Well, no, people know the difference between right and wrong when they're 15 as well, don't they? Let's be honest. So it is more complicated. Yes, and I think public opinion is stacked up against uh, this young woman returning, but it's an interesting debate nonetheless. In Saturday's Mail, security drones that protect us oh, yeah. against stalkers are being trialled by Nottingham University. Andrew, this is quite Robocop, -y, isn't it? Well, it's very Robocop, because you remember the scene in Robocop where, where he... Uh, finds a sexual assault going on in a, oh, a yes. and shines the light on the assailant and and kills him or at least debilitates him um, and this is a similar thing so what would happen is you know like that you have alarms so so young women can carry rape alarms yeah. which will will obviously deter you know make a very loud noise and draw attention and this would be a a, th a sort of alarm that summons a drone and the drones are uh, apparently uh, they, wow. they, they they cost 35,000 pounds app controlled drones they they emerge within 4 minutes right which is incredibly quickly. There's a spotlight, thermal camera. I mean, it would work, right? So that's the thing about this. It would completely work. And you've got, um, and it's much, much faster. Uh, it's, and, and ultimately the drones, although they're initially expensive, are, are, are cheaper to run. Um, so look, I think it seems like a good idea to me. I, I, you know, I don't normally like robot technology and all that stuff scares me. Drones scare the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've read some sort of very dystopic idea about what, where it could go in the future when they, when they yeah. learn to attack us. If, if these drones are going to work properly, they'll need, I would have thought, 13-year-old kids to actually control them. Well, I don't know. I've never I'm... seen an adult successfully <laughs> control oh, that's a drone true. Young people can in, do in it, a park. They? Yeah, you, you, need, you need sort of, you know, some what? sort of rather grumpy teenager. You do. That's uh, With a, probably yeah. built one in, in his, you know, bedroom. Because, I mean, it is amazing technology. I've got to say, Hayden, I've never had a problem with CCTV, so I say bring on the drones. I'm big on personal privacy, but for mm. me, cameras in high streets have been um, fantastic for abso safety. Absolutely. I've had thefts of camera equipment and CCTV would have been amazing, but there's nothing police can do, can do unless they can see what's going on. Yeah, I, I think the privacy thing used to be a bigger thing 10 years ago, right, until we all basically signed up to Apple and Facebook and gave away all our data for free. I'm yes. not sure who really cares anymore, especially if it's going to... You're going to touch a hellfire missile to the... I mean, I'm a bit more, nuke the, I'm a bit more sceptical than you are over the, like, the cameras everywhere. I sort of feel... Because like, I don't fully trust the state, if I'm honest. I don't, uh, you know... But you trust... You trust well, this is why we, we I cannot trust Mark Zuckerberg. Have, right? We cannot have these biometric passports. You know, you can't yeah. set the precedent of demonstrating, let's say, your COVID vaccine status with, with a little, you know, electronic card, because then that opens the door to state surveillance. But at the moment... More eyes on us, I just think, is money well spent, especially if it, if it means women are safer. I mean, this is a better solution, isn't it, than having female police officers in pubs listening in on conversations to find out if a or, woman is being harassed, which was or, suggested yeah. by cops. Or waving down a bus, which was the other suggestion. If what, they told women to wave down a bus? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Good luck with that in the forest. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. interesting stuff. Good. Well, look, we'll uh, watch that development uh, with great interest. The silent menace that our uh, e-scooters yes. mm. could soon be a thing of the past. Hayden, tell us more. 130 pedestrians were injured by e-scooters in the year of June 2021. 
They do. They just come up right behind well, you. In the month of June? Yes, in the month of June. One month. So lot. they're thinking of forcing these companies to put sounds into the scooters. Like, I have a little speaker in the scooter. Yeah. Either that or the person riding the scooter has to go brum, brum, brum very, <laughs> right. very, very loudly. But uh, this is a University College London initiative. Uh, it seems smart. Would it be sort of dramatic music like in an Alfred Hitchcock movie? Yeah. Like, da, 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 da. Or, or something like Little Mix, so people would run away instinctively. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Early Ed Sheeran. Something James like Blunt. That. Something like that. But the thing about it is, is like, I didn't realise, I mean, I'm only reading this article today, and I didn't realise the extent of, A, the accidents, but also the fact that these things are absolutely everywhere. I mean, I don't go out mm. very much, but I don't see them. But, it's, you know, they are, I mean, they're quite undignified, aren't they? Can't we just yes, ban them? Can we just not have them in pedestrian areas, surely? Doesn't that make sense? There are also people get their phone nicked a lot. Yes. If someone, someone comes up behind, it's super silent, and you just whisk the phone away, and you're gone. I met yeah. my girlfriend the other day, actually. I think they need... The, it really? happened to your girlfriend? Yeah, yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. And you were not there to defend I her? I was not there to... Or were you on the scooter? No, I just was <laughs> scarpering away into the corner. No, I wasn't there. It was... Uh, it's yeah, not good. Both, not, both not, not, not a nice experience. Horrible, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think obviously they're a great environmental solution, aren't they? But I feel like this technology needs to be properly legislated for because, I mean, you mentioned pedestrians. That's a big concern. But then I'm almost horrified, as horrified when you see e-scooters on the road. Oh, they're not allowed to do that, though. Well, it happens that, that, all the time. That is illegal. Is that right? So, so they just need to enforce that a little bit more. Mm, good yeah. luck with that. Well, sure. Interesting stuff. Well, I'll be careful when I e-scoot home tonight. Um, interesting. Now, uh, let's look at Saturday's Telegraph. Going with a possible scandal involving the European Commission president and COVID vaccines. Hayden, um, this will get tongues wagging, won't it? Uh, this is, um, yeah, a text between the head of Pfizer and Ursula von der Leyen, yeah, right? who is the EU commissioner. That's right. She's the head of the EU commission. But she was trying to sort out a deal. I can't find the story, but she was trying to sort out a deal for the vaccine. which 1.8 million doses or something. Mm, right. And it's she... the ultimate drug deal, isn't it? It is the ultimate <laughs> drug deal. Do you think yeah. she did it on WhatsApp? Yeah. There's lots of emojis. Probably. Yeah. But I don't know why she won't just release the, the text messages. She got quite a bad deal, right? Because once she got involved, vaccine prices rose from 50, 1550 euros to 1950 euro, uh, euros a shot. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So she's obviously not, she hasn't read the art of the deal. But it just doesn't seem to be like <laughs> massive corruption. It just seems to, perhaps there was some hanky panky going There's on some between Ursula and the head of Pfizer. Perhaps it was genitals that were being sort of texted as, as opposed to something really nefarious and corrupt. I don't know. Yeah, that would make I don't sense. Know. I mean, why, it, it depends how much onanism the uh, head of Pfizer goes <laughs> oh, in for. This is the word of the day. Yeah. <laughs> it isn't really it? Is. Um, I'm glad we're doing that. Um, I, look, the thing is, I mean, I think Hayden might have a point. There must have been something more to this conversation. Why wouldn't you release? I mean, the EU mm. has a, uh, a strict rules about transparency, apparently. And um, the, if the president, I mean, but this is, look, why are we surprised about this? I mean, the European Commission is just a completely unaccountable undemocratic group. No one voted them in. Well, she was voted in by the parliament, but mm. there's no direct democracy there. I mean, so it, I don't know why anyone would be surprised that they just decide to do what they want and go along with it. But, you know, like Pfizer, yeah. And they, like Pfizer, sure. Yeah. They have had a nightmare when it comes to the rollout of the vaccine, especially yeah. early on in the pandemic, because Britain speculated um, big time on the AstraZeneca vaccine, pre-ordered yeah. many, and the EU wanted to have a kind of nation-by-nation -nation collective approach. Yeah, who would have thought? It took ages. Who would have thought that a bureaucratic trading block wouldn't be able to you know, speed these things through. No, yeah, no great and it wasn't great because the first thing that happened is that the, the commission threatened to erect a border between the Northern Ireland and the Republic, yeah. which is, you know, we had four years, four and a half years of Brexit negotiations in which that was the sticking point. Yeah. And, and of course, the vaccine rollout was slower. So overall, not a good look for the commission. No, I mean, it's certainly since the, uh, all of the wranglings over the Northern Irish border, it's certainly that a lot of people, and certainly with the rollout of the vaccine, a lot of people are thinking we did vote the right way. And even people who voted Remain are now thinking that. I mean, the European, the European Union has not covered itself with glory. Mm. And actually, what the, all of this kind of stuff does is it does remind us of how the EU operates. I mean, look, I'm being very partisan here. You know what I feel about this. Mm. Uh, so if you want to come in with a, with a pro-EU argument... No, listen, can I just say, uh, I know Hayden, he's willing to defend billionaires and oh, Vladimir Putin, but he's them. not going to defend the EU. He just can't bring yourself to, can he? <laughs> oh, I love the EU. There we go. But only because uh, I like to go there on holiday. But you like I'm, very, I'm a metropolitan you, you don't want elitist. To, you, you it's don't all don't I care be, about is my... You don't want to be in the slow queue, the non-EU. No, exactly. You know, we, we can I want still, to be able to get my champagne. We can still go on holiday to those places. Can we? Yeah, we can still do it. Right, OK. It's amazing. Jesus, did I, it recently. I need to read something other than The Guardian. You do. Yeah. Definitely. Everyone should take that advice. Yeah. No echo chambers here, let me tell you. So many more great stories to come. Um, thank you so much for your company. After this, we've got Italian tears, pyjama etiquette, and some rather hairy legs. First up, the weather. 
Hello, we've got some stormy weather to come across the northern half of the UK this weekend. A very windy picture through Saturday. Some spells of rain to come at times too, with the quietest of the weather towards the south. That's because this area of high pressure is sliding away. We've got an area of low pressure being named Storm Malik by the Danish Met Service, giving some very strong winds. But yet another system then piling in for Sunday. A lot of cloud in the sky overnight tonight. Temperatures, if anything, rising a little bit through the night with all that cloud around. But it's across western Scotland where we'll see the rain piling in, turning heavy and persistent. We could see up to 80 millimetres of rain here with some strengthening winds towards the end of the night. But look at our temperatures, 7 to 10 degrees Celsius. So those winds will be very strong through the morning, widely 50 to 60 mile an hour gusts, potentially 70 to 80 miles an hour. The Met Office have issued an amber warning for northeastern parts of Scotland where we could see some damaging gusts of wind to come through the day. And it remains windy through much of the day. Even further south, the winds will start to pick up, staying quite cloudy across the far south of the UK, but elsewhere brightening skies, a few showers pushing their way through and cooler weather with the blustery conditions. Now the worst of the winds will ease through Saturday evening, pulling out into the North Sea. With that ridge of high pressure building in then, we'll see the skies clearing, the winds easing down, and a touch of frost is likely as we start the day on Sunday. Temperatures in rural spots getting close to freezing. But you can already see out towards the west this next system starting to push its way in. That'll start to increase the cloud across the sky, so a hazy sunny start but quickly turning quite cloudy. And I think as we go into the afternoon on Sunday, we will see that wet weather pushing in across Scotland. Notice it bumping into the colder air, could give some hill snow as well. And later on, we will see those winds turn very strong once again, where warnings remain in place for Sunday. We'll keep you updated with the latest. Bye-bye. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Welcome back to Headliners on GB News TV and Radio. We're taking a comedic romp through tomorrow's papers in the company of two comedic colossuses. Colossi, they're a right pair of colossuses. Andrew Doyle and Hayden Prowse. Now, how about this? One of our programme's star names, Leo Curse, has made Saturday's papers. Leo took part in a debate about cancel culture on Good Morning Britain. Uh, and that was uh, earlier today. And it's fair to say things got a bit heated. Take a look.
Boris Johnson said that uh, he thought that uh, women in burkas look like letterboxes. That's, that's not an expression of hate. It's just a visual gag. This is unacceptable, Neil. Your words are utterly reprehensible. I, of think, the I think you're painting. Neil, that you're is building why a straw man part argument. Of the I think this is a very tolerant so and a very Paul, loving but place and a very accepting Sparks always fly when Leo's around. That's why we love him. But Andrew, what do you think? Well, I mean, that's an, you saw just there. No one could hear each other at all. It, it just it just became absolute chaos. So this was a debate about cancel culture, and you had Leo Kirst, who is, as you know, one of the headliners, uh, and the activist and lawyer Dr. Shola Moss Shogbamimu. Um, although embarrassingly, the host couldn't pronounce her name. The host Kate Gar Kate Garurway, I think it's Kate Garurway. <laughs> couldn't pronounce it, so that was quite embarrassing. But then we got into the big row, um, and um, they just wouldn't. The, the thing is about Dr. Scholl is she often uh, t uh, talks over people, and you can hear it. There's a, and, and to the extent that we couldn't hear anyone at all, she was so angry by what Leo had said. And Leo has that capability, doesn't he, to make to yeah, he, he irritates. He's quite irritating. Typ typical Scott. I don't really like him. Uh, or Scots generally, actually. Yeah, I mean, he's verbose, he's a bully, he's yeah. annoying, and he joins us live. Yeah. Hi, Leo. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hayden, I heard what you said. I want you to pronounce my name. Uh, pronounce my name. Curse. Pronounce it properly. Curse. Phonetically. Curse. Pronounce my name phonetically. <laughs> Your remarks were unacceptable and reprehensible. The amount of discrimination that Scottish people suffer at the hands of perfumed English ponces, such as He's yourself, probably... is <laughs> unacceptable. It's unacceptable. You have the audacity to sit there and mispronounce my name by not trying to pronounce it. It's, it's, un you, it's unacceptable. Are you on heroin and iron brew right now, Leo? You. It's a very heady mix. Uh, listen, Leo, you smashed it. It was an amazing bit of telly. How was the experience overall? It was really, it was really quite strange because uh, we, we just the, the the discussion just ended because we had to go to, to a commercial break. It wasn't it wasn't canned for any other reason, and uh, yeah, I couldn't really hear my my earpiece uh, died about halfway through, so I couldn't really hear anything that uh, anybody was saying. Uh, so that's why you know we were talking over each other. Well, I think um, Dr. Shola was talking over me because that's what she does. She got like about sixty percent, seventy percent of the airtime in that, and the comment that I've been I've been slot in the press is some sort of like you know far-right malignant racist just for saying that you know yeah boris's gag about the the letterboxes it's, it's just a visual gag it's not hateful it's just you know we, we make and it's equivalent to, to the gammon gag you know if you say middle-aged men with rosy cheeks are gammon-esque then why can't we make you know visual illusions with with other other people? Uh, I, th I think it's ridiculous. I think um, I think Dr. Dr. Shola, uh, you know, is, is vastly overinflating this and actually breeding a lot more resentment and uh, division than uh, than the people who are supposedly racist. Uh, what does it tell you about Good Morning Britain as a show? I mean, is it a home of free speech? What's your experience been? Would you do it again? Yeah, I'd do it again. Um, you have to get up really early. And it was kind of strange. Instead of going into the studio, they sent a camera crew round to my flat. So I just did it in the flat. Um, so that, that was a bit strange. But I had to get up so early. And I was gigging last night. I was gigging off. I was gigging with Simon Evans, another, another, another host of headliners. So that was down in Hove. Um, so I was knackered. I had like, you know, five hours sleep and I had to get up and, and do this thing. Five hours isn't a lot for a comedian. <laughs> no, um, so, yeah, but I'd, I'd do it again. I love doing GB News. I, 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 good morning, Britain. Every, every time I go on there, I get, I get so many. Uh, last time I was, I was um, saying Prince George should be bullied and I got so many death threats. It was, it was really invigorating. <laughs> well, long may it continue. Not the death threats, but your television appearances. That's why we love you on Headliners, Leo. I'll let you get back to bed because I know five hours sleep is like a nap for a stand-up comedian. <laughs> but you'll be returning very soon to Headliners. You are a legend. We love you. Tomorrow night. I'm on tomorrow night. Okay. Tomorrow night. See you there with dark <laughs> rings around your eyes. But we'll get your name correctly pronounced. The brilliant Leo Curse, who, of course, has made the papers. Who knew? Onto the Daily Mail now. China has changed the end of the movie Fight Club to a happy ending. Andrew. Yeah, well, actually, this article is focusing on the writer of the novel, Chuck, I'm going to actually mispronounce this, Chuck Pal Palanwick. 
uh, who wrote the novel Fight Club, um, and he said he's fine with the ending. So, you know, this was reported a few days ago. Chinese authorities, the Chinese government has demanded that the, the ending of the film when it's played in China is mm. changed because at the end, the capitalists lose, the government, the, the authority loses, and so they've changed it so that uh, the authorities win at the end. And, and, and Chuck is saying that actually that is closer to what he wrote in the original original uh, novel, and he's not too bothered about it. I mean, I suppose, um, the thing is, this is what authoritarian regimes do. They, they change, they target works of art and creativity, and they change it, and they, they make it closer to their ideological message. It wouldn't happen here, you know? You, it would never ha you wouldn't see the BBC cutting, say, scenes from comedy shows that don't align with their ideological <laughs> message. You wouldn't see it Netflix just what, chopping like and changing various things. Classic sitcoms like Faulty Towers, they wouldn't dare wouldn't touch those because we're great not, works of art. We're not an authoritarian regime like the Chinese, so we would never dare do that. Yeah. What do you think, Hayden? You, you're seriously comparing us to the Chinese regime, Xi Jinping? In a, in a whimsical way. Right. I think we're getting yeah. there. A sort of uh, rhetorical point. You would say that you would agree, however, that there is an authoritarian... Oh, yeah. It's never about. good in any instance. I mean, he says, uh, Chuck, in this uh, interview, that he's... His, uh, his works are banned in all sorts of uh, states in America as well, so they there's are. all sorts of censorship um, of, of his work, although it is pretty filthy. Most of his novels are pretty disgusting. Have you read some? I've read some, yeah. Pretty dark it's material. lots of onanism, but with added extras. Even, even you yeah. sound disapproving of yes. it. Yes. You think it's ban outrageous. him. <laughs> ban this filth. It's odd, though. The new Victoria. I mean, he, you know, if anything, I think, you know, writers always have to deal with adaptations of their work changing. Quentin Tarantino, when he wrote True Romance and Tony Scott directed the film, he completely changed the ending. Tarantino was furious at first, but then he learned to re he realized that that's what happened. The ending of. Brighton Rock is different from yeah. the novel, although approved by Graham Greene, who wrote the screenplay yes. for that film. Which, which is, is a great novel and a great film. Why, why do you think that they changed the ending of that? I mean, we won't spoil it, but well, why do you think they changed it? Sometimes it's... Well, I don't know in that particular case, but mm. sometimes when they do, for instance, test screenings, and the audience say, mm. we didn't like the end. So the worst case of that is Little Shop of Horrors, the musical. Uh, the ending is, of course, the plants take over the whole world. And there's a fantastic, brilliant scene where they're just seen rampaging through the streets of New York and everything. But the, the, the audiences hated that. So they refilmed a sort of happier, sweeter ending, which isn't as good. Um, I don't trust audiences. I think you trust the auteur. You trust mm. the filmmaker or the, or the writers. I think you do. I mean, movie adaptations of books can be notoriously disappointing, can't they? Yeah. Stephen King was furious about... The Shining. No, they got it right. Because in Stephen King's novel, the hedges start attacking people, and it's hilarious and stupid. And so they got it. And, and of course, the, the, Stanley Kubrick introduced the uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, which is a really great piece, isn't in the book. Yeah. So I think I'm with Kubrick. If it's Kubrick versus King, I'm with Kubrick. Yeah, and actually the thing about these great artists, these great novelists, is that they hate the adaptation until they see the box office receipts and the mm. Oscar nominations, and right. then they think again. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Well, let's crack on because we've got many more stories to squeeze in before midnight. It's easy to be cold of heart in this day and age, sadly, but The Times has a story about a rather public display of masculine emotion, Andrew. Yes, uh, this is Riccardo Meggiorini, who is a, an Italian football player, who on the pitch, um, you know how footballers engage in a bit of trash talk, don't they? Mm. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I've never really played it or watched it or know anything about it, but I do know that. In cricket, they call it sledging. Is that what they call it? Yeah. OK, so, so it's, a, it's, it's a kind of like, it's, it's bants, isn't it? Yeah. But it's intended to undermine uh, the other player. I think it goes on a lot with penalties. Is that right? Mm. Well, I can see how, I mean, it clearly works. So this is a, a uh, Slovenian player called, called Zan Meyer who insulted his mother. Now, as anyone, any schoolboy knows, that's trash talk from the playground. That's everyone does that. But the problem is that, that um, uh, Maggiorini's mother had died in 2017, so it was a bit uh, raw for him. Yes. And he started crying on, on the pitch. Uh, and I understand that. And particularly in Italy, it's a very matriarchal society. There's yes. a very strong connection to, to mothers. You don't criticise someone's family, and especially their mother. No, and of course this uh, Slovenian player wasn't actually making a comment about his mother. It was the conventions of it trash talk. It was generic, yeah. Exactly. Um, and he did feel bad and he did apologise. And it's just one of those moments where you don't normally... Although you do see footballers crying. I remember Gaza doing it. Yeah. He's quite drunk. a lot. Was he drunk when he did that? Yeah. Oh. Well, I think uh, it was the World Cup, wasn't it? Uh, and, very famously. Uh, we, were, yes. we were exiting we were winning, winning the uh, tournament. Yeah. And yeah. he, was, uh, he was definitely grieving a sort of sporting disaster. But mm. isn't it nice to see guys showing yeah. some emotion? It's really sweet. And then his captain gave him a hug, didn't he? It was, yeah. And, yeah, made him feel Do better. we want more of that? Some people yeah. will be watching saying this is the feminisation yes. of the tradition of football. Yeah. We're becoming a feminised world. 
But I mean, I'm there might be that. there might be a bit of trolling going on on the pitch, but it can't be worse than what's shouted from the stands, can it? No. And if you've ever played competitive mm. backgammon, it gets pretty ugly. Let me oh tell yeah. You. They, yeah, those people are the worst. Are the worst? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, they go in, they have a few beers, and they really know how they to psychologically start... destroy. It's like Hannibal Lecter. They know how to get in your head. <laughs> they do it. Now, moving swiftly on, the Daily Mail. Um, a debate, I think, that needs to be had. Is it ever OK to wear your pyjamas outside of the house? I'm sort of fascinated by this because this was a, uh, a kind of um, review of uh, what are the snobbiest opinions that British people have. And, uh, and they, re they revealed in this article uh, in the Mail, it talks about how some of these opinions are, for instance, uh, fingernails are trashy. I presume they mean painted fingernails, not just fingernails, because we all have fingernails. Yeah, that's um, harsh. Apparently, anyone dripping in gold and designer clothes is vulgar. Well, that sounds like the Pope to me. Could be Buster Rhymes, I don't know. And Mr T, of course. Mr T. For, for, for uh, older viewers. What about this one? They say that... Um, I didn't know about this, so apparently French bulldogs are trashy and common. If you've got a French... And, and they're adorable animals. I know they're the new whippets, aren't they? And everyone has one, and it is a bit common and mm. predictable. Is it, because, is it because they, they dribble or something? Is that... French bulldogs don't. That, you're thinking of English bulldogs. Uh -huh. That's one of the advantages of the French variety. OK. They're very sweet temperament. But, I mean, what, how do you know that this dog is lower class? Does it read I think the what... Daily Express? I, think... <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, exactly. I think it's just one of these things that um, it's surveying. You know the way... Do you remember that famous uh, interview where Katie Hopkins said that Anyone who had a daughter who was mm. named after a place name, mm. like, was, was... like Brooklyn or something. Even though her daughter was called India, I think. It yes. happens. It happens in all sorts. I mean, I live in Hackney, and I've defriended anyone who doesn't drink oat milk, and you know, anyone who's not vegan, and they're just gone out of my social circle. So yeah, That's you know, which is reasonable. If you see anyone eating actual food, you yes. just cut them out of your life. Absolutely. Really, absolutely. Yeah, I'll just shame them on social media. Aaron, yeah, I didn't know about this one though. If you have a tattoo on your face. People who assume you're a criminal or an idiot. I'm glad I, I got rid of mine, actually. <laughs> well, I think this story is connected because from one high-level debate to another at the Star paper, hairy legs on women are good enough reason to end a relationship, Hayden. Uh, absolutely not. I'm into that. Hairy armpits, hairy legs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You're, you're pretty hirsute yourself. I am, you? yeah, it's true. Very subjective, yeah. though. I mean, this, this, this guy broke up, according to this story, this guy broke up with his girlfriend because she sent him a picture of her, her hairy legs, mm. sort of saying, look at that, and it was a joke. And he said, actually, that really turns me off. But we don't, we don't control our sexuality, do we? I mean, if that turns you off, I think there's the picture. I think that, that's fair. I knew, I knew someone who slept with someone who could only be aroused if they were listening to um, audio books by Alan Bennett. Mm. Um, and, and so everyone has a different That's thing. definitely freakier than hairy legs. I say let it all hang out. Brilliant stuff. Well, look, my thanks to my amazing co-panelists today, Andrew Doyle and Hayden Prowse, who will return very soon. Lots more to come. We will have another headliners in which we'll be looking at Sunday's papers. And it's been brilliant to have your company. I'm back tomorrow at nine. See you then. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk.